everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have a video that has been two years in the making. This is the making of an heir to murder. Over the course of the last two years I have been recording short video clips of my writing of an heir to murder. I have wanted to do this with a book for the longest time. The idea of recording my process of writing this book comes from watching singers, strangely enough, and filmmakers and seeing the making of documentaries, the behind the scenes bits, because oftentimes I talk about how I will enjoy the process of watching something being made more than I actually enjoy the creation itself. I knew that I wanted to create these vlogs but I always anticipated it being for the final Doris book or something to do with that to tie up the entire series and I remember one day in March 2018 I knew that I wanted to share this story with people but I was keeping it a secret and the only way that I could think to get through all of my insecurities and my issues with writing was to vent them at the camera, have no one able to respond to me but releasing the words into the world was somewhat cathartic. This video is a culmination of all the work that I, myself and other people have put into helping create this book and because of that I have decided to share it today. I hope that if you are a struggling writer you're able to take some heart in knowing that all writers struggle to get their books finished but there is a finish line. Throughout these clips I discovered that I just have to trust my own gut sometimes when creating a first draft. People are more supportive than I previously believed. Here is the making of an heir to murder. I actually planned on starting making these videos way back in January when I first started working on this. Now I should say that I didn't actually start working on this until the end of January. It was one of those things where I didn't really feel like continuing the children's book after writing one chapter. It was also one of those things where I knew that I couldn't actually tell anyone about it because I had just told people about a story that I wasn't going to continue writing and so I thought you know what let's not do this. So nobody actually knows about this story right now and we're currently March the 10th. So I've been writing this book for just over a month. I don't have a computer. My computer is still dead. I chose to give my father back the money that I was putting towards a computer um, because I owed him money from having to pay my car insurance back in November and so I just didn't feel comfortable having that money and having this debt on my head that I'd have to pay off later anyway so I've paid that off. I'm quite happy to be writing by hand, that's how I wrote the second Doris book so I don't have any qualms about doing that. I suppose the reason I'm actually showing this notebook is because I've only got two pages left to fill. I currently have the rotor for the creative writing group and then this bit here, these 50 pages, is all dedicated to the novel that I am currently writing. And that book is a book that I have been trying to create since I was 12 years old. And it is a cosy crime novel. It is about a younger character. She's 25 and I'm 25 but when I was right, when I first came up with the idea she was a lot older than me and I never actually intended to be writing about her when we're the same age. Her name is Alice Valentine and we've got a lot of the same insecurities and she has family members that I didn't expect to be main characters within the story have been very prominent within these last 50 pages. Her father Norman and his wife Primrose, who is also her mother, I don't know why I said it like that. Basically when I was 12 years old I was watching Last of the Summer Wine with my nan. There was an episode and I was like this would make a great idea for a crime series and I began to write this story of a former detective, his librarian friend, and their friend who was still in the police force, all older gentlemen going out of their way to solve a murder and it was going to be the murder of a missing girl. And I kept trying to write that book for years, I changed the protagonist to make him more of a ragamuffin. All these characters, eventually when I got to writing Doris I realised I actually 
had the world that Doris was going to live in. I always knew that there was going to be a cosy crime novel in there. There was this article in the writing magazine where another crime writer said about how they'd killed off their detective and that made way for the character that was the main character. I was like, yes, this, this is what I have to do. So in this book, Alice returns to Partridge Muse, a place that she's never wanted to return. Within her first few weeks of being there, discovers the dead body of the former detective, Arthur Sterling. And she and the caretaker of her auntie's house, who happens to be a police consultant, decide to solve the mystery, for Arthur was one of Duke's friends. So, so far I'm 50 pages in, and I haven't yet hit the plot, and I'm about to start a new notebook. We'll see how it goes really, but I am enjoying what I'm writing, and I don't know whether that's actually a good thing, I don't know whether, as it is a first draft, I'll just, I just keep going. It's one of those things where I'm just trusting my gut on this one, I'm trusting the characters to take me where they want to go, I'm trusting in their story, and I think that it's all going to turn out well in the end. Currently, I haven't told my friend Lindsay about this book. My manager at work has guessed a few of the details about this book, um, because, but that was simply because of a conversation we were having. We were talking about Death in Paradise and we were talking about the cosy crime things on the television and she says that she thinks that that would be a good genre for me to write in. And I was just there like, well, obviously I have not told her about the book, she doesn't know about the book, it's clearly just, it seems like a good fit for the type of person that I am. Boris too has really given me the permission to write this book. This book had to come out now because it's set between Doris 1 and 2 and I meant to bring it out after the first book but I was just too scared and we know that I'm trying to get rid of fear so I'll see you next time. Today is the 26th of March 2018 and I have been writing in the new notebook for maybe a fortnight now, which is very upsetting to say because I have only reached 10 pages in this new notebook. I've just started the 11th, but that does bring us to 61 A5 pages. I'm about to approach the plot, finally. Like, the big thing that drives this book and leads us into the whole, like, cosy crime part of this book still hasn't happened at 60 pages and I'm like, am I actually writing a cosy crime novel or am I writing the novel about these people and the crime is going to happen? It's something that I've always seen of as a series, I don't know, is the thing. I'm gonna have to wait and see how the book actually goes and then edit the thing. That's gonna be, that's gonna be the big problem, editing, because I keep writing really long paragraphs that list all of the things I want to say about something and I blame Daphne du Maurier for that. Um, and Sarah was. I blame all the slow books I've been reading recently. I rewrote a scene that I originally wrote nearly three years ago now, and I am going to look back at the first draft when I eventually get a computer and see whether I prefer that version or this version, but I feel like this version's a bit more measured and not as, like, out there, so I might keep this one, we'll see. I'm also really feeling the thing of not having a computer at this point because I'm like, I've got 60 pages I have to type up now. I, I feel like if I was writing on a computer I would be able to get my thoughts out mo co more coherently. With this I keep having to remember what I wanted to write, and whilst I do have a plan sometimes you forget because the characters take you off in a different direction. I'm introducing all these characters and they're all having arguments and motives are all coming out and these are like the main players of the series but I'm like shouldn't this like could this all be happening after I've actually killed off Arthur Sterling. Yeah, I'm hoping to be able to afford a laptop when my next wage comes in. I've got an event today so I'm hoping to be able to sell some books and if I do that then I am gonna go straight to the bank and be like, right, let's get this money in, let's get this done. Lord knows I need to actually get back online and get things done and get some writing done and yeah, all that fun stuff. So we're currently 80 pages into Alice Valentine's story and I'm slowly having the realisation that maybe Primrose needs to be a more prominent character. I thought that this story would be about Alice and Marmaduke solving a crime, but everywhere I turn, Primrose appears as some sort of foil. I like the relationship that she has with Alice, and I don't know whether I ought to explore that more if Primrose is going to continue to be such a prominent feature within this story. I mean, Alice is only 25, and when I look at my own relationship with my mother, we do, you know, we regularly talk. 
I mean, we live in the same house when she's not at home, we're texting each other. So I think that maybe Primrose, in fact, maybe even Norman are going to become more prominent than I originally thought. I, it doesn't mean that I want to lessen the plans that I have for Duke, but I do think that I'll have to navigate how he's going to work into the book because he seemed like such a great idea and I really appreciate his character and I've done a lot to build him up but I think that there still needs to be more. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe because I have made Primrose such a prominent character from the start that it doesn't seem right to almost replace her with Marmaduke. Especially since I think Primrose has connections that could help solve crimes as well, and she would be able to get people to speak to Alice and Duke, who we wouldn't ordinarily get to see because I'm beginning to think that this is definitely, it's not just about one character, it's about a lot of characters. Whilst I did like the idea of focusing in on Alice and Alice being our way into this story, being completely baffled by the people around her, I do think that it's less of a cosy crime novel and more of a cosy novel in which crime happens. I will have to see how it goes. I'm just going, I'm still going to just write it and see how everything turns out. There are still no chapters at this point, although I do have ideas as to where chapter starts and endings could happen. It's different to our Doris in that with our Doris I had very set ideas of what plots were going to feature in each monologue, whereas here I'm just writing it knowing what's going to happen in each scene. And I worry that the same thing that used to happen with me with my other plans is going to happen here. I have written one sentence and what happens in that sentence isn't as prominent as everything else like it is literally just a sentence of so and so does this I feel like I'm just writing so and so does this and then moving on and the scenes aren't ending up how I thought that they'd end up the first investigative scene where a character goes and speaks to Alice a policeman to ask her about the murder. We don't talk about the murder. We talk about their relationship at school. I didn't necessarily plan to talk to you about this at only 80 pages, but this was just where my head was at last night and I thought it best to document it here so that I remember in future that I did actually have plans for Alice, Primrose, and all of the characters within the book. So I haven't currently told anyone that I have bought a new computer, but I did end up buying a laptop at the beginning of May. It was an extremely extravagant purchase, but I'm quite happy with it. Um, there's a lot of getting to know new things, and I do feel every inch a technophobe. Last Monday, and um, no, last Sunday and Monday, I ended up typing up the entirety of the 93 pages that I currently have, and I have to say I did end up a bit disappointed. I'd worked out with the first notebook I was using that one A4 page would probably amount to two A5 pages, but I was wrong. Um, it was about three, well, two and a half to three, and I write quite small to try and be able to, like, figure out how long the book's going to be. And it did work out that I was right with, like, my words count of being about 21,000. I'd guessed that, but it was still a bit disappointing to only see 40 pages there. For the last week, the writing has stalled. I was writing some poetry for Margaret, and... Like, you know, sometimes you do need a break from longer pieces. I've said this before, when I'm writing longer pieces, I will, like, take time out and I'll read and I'll write all the, th you know, write shorter things just so that I don't grow tired of constantly working on the same thing. But I'm, I'm worried. I've got this worry that there aren't enough jokes because I've been reading parts to people. Well, I've read the first three pages now twice at one of Margaret's open mics and once in front of the writer's group but neither time have I informed them these are actually from the secret book. I've said both times that this is from um, something that I might work on, but I might not. And people have laughed, but I don't know that I continue that humour throughout, and it was always my intention to, like, you know, make this funny. And I know it's a cosy crime novel, but I still want it to sound like me. This is a book that I wanted to write for years. I wanted to write it after the first Doris book, and I didn't. I wanted to get a series finished before I brought this book out, and I still might do that. But sometimes I question, does that then mean that the work I'm doing doesn't mean anything? And that's a really strange thought to have. The thing is, I've planned it all. I've planned this entire book. I know where this book is going. I, I just, I think that I need to include more anecdotes. I think I know what I need to do. I don't find what I'm writing boring. Quite like this whole thing of like, 
creating an expanded universe of Partridge and Muse. I'm like, is anyone else going to care? Am I the only person who's caring here? I know that this difficult point arises every time. I usually get to like this between 20,000 and 30,000 words and reach this point where I'm like, am I doing the right thing here? Is this right? And I know that this is an actual part of my writing process. I wish that I could write quicker. I wish that I could stop getting in my own head about what I'm working on. And I wish I could just finish the damn thing. Because I know that I'm going to enjoy the story when I'm finished. The book that I'm writing is A Cozy Crime. It's such a large market. Like, it's so overcrowded anyway. So, I question what is the point. I know it's something that I want to do. But what is the point when so many people are also doing it? I'll check in some time and we'll see how things have gone. We finally reached page 100. In reaching page 100, we realised that we should actually be following our plans a bit because we haven't been following the plan and we ended up revealing great big spoilery twists in one scene that weren't supposed to be revealed until we'd revealed other information earlier. So now, I've gone back, I've got this really cheap notepad from the shop that had all gone yellow with age, rewriting that scene in here, and I don't know that I'll staple it in, but I might staple it in, but we'll see. So that scene's got to be rewritten before I can continue. I didn't think I'd be doing this, but that's the type of writer that I am. I actually, when I know that something is wrong within the story, at that point, I can't rewrite, I can't work on the story until I've gone back and sorted out that bit, which is probably why I don't end up having or doing huge edits myself because I tend to edit along the way and get it all sorted as I'm going. I'm not saying it doesn't still need editing once it's finished because it does, but I do tend to rework everything as I go as opposed to rework everything later and hope for the best. I've included a new plot, subplot. I don't know how it's going to work. I didn't intend to do it. This was one of those things of the characters leading me there and me thinking that it would make for a great subplot and some humour to the story and whilst also giving us backstory to a few characters because I ended up actually really enjoying the writing of some of the characters as I went along. So they became more of a focus. And this was always supposed to be a novel about characters in which crime happens. And that is the way I always envisaged this series. It was always going to be about the same cast of characters, them dealing with different crimes within the community. This is a series I never saw myself traditionally publishing because of the way I want to write it, because I don't know that there is such a big market for these tales of community. Now, I know that there are books that do that. I'm not that arrogant anymore that I don't know. There are books out there with huge community casts all working together to create this story. Within crime fiction, there's often only a few main characters. So you'll have your detective sidekick. Possible, if like mine, it's a cosy crime, there'll be a link to the police force somewhere. And then a few friends that show up every now and then. Here, instead, I have that main supportive cast throughout. But I found that I do like writing more with a larger cast all working together and I don't know whether it comes from me having having such a large family, I don't know if it comes from me having such a large support network. There's definitely six main characters, not six main characters, that's the wrong thing to say, there's six characters who I plan to have as mainstays within this book and any sequels should they happen. However, I'm not tying myself down to that right now. And their stories are important, and I know the first few years of their lives from now. I know currently they're 25, because I was writing this book when I was younger, and 25 seemed like a hugely old age. And now I'm 26, and I just feel so sad about it, because these characters were never supposed to be younger than me. I mean, technically they're still older than me, because I'm setting this book in 2015. I'll see you again. Today is Friday the 17th of August and on Wednesday, which was the 15th, I finished writing my book. The cosy crime novel that I have wanted to write since I was a child is finished. The first draft is finished in any case. 
I've mentioned in an earlier portion of these videos how when I was 12 I wanted to create a book about older detectives, retired detectives, in a similar line to Last of the Summer Wine, and I could never get it right. I don't know whether it's writing the Doris books that finally gave me the skill and the knowledge to know how to craft this book, but it's done. Despite knowing that there are changes that are going to have to be made, I myself am incredibly happy to have finished it. I did not imagine finishing it in August. I honestly believe that this would be a book that took me another year to write. I thought this was going to be a February to February type deal. Then a few weeks ago, it's mentioned in a writing vlog, no less, that I came to work and the cat wanted letting in. And honestly, if it wasn't for that cat, I don't think that I would have recorded the little video I did that day and kept going for the week. So we're blaming the shop cat for spurring me on to finish my book because then it became this thing of writing every day. I, I have been locked away in my room for two and a half weeks just working on this book and living with these characters. By the end of those two and a half weeks, I felt incredibly attached to the characters. There was definitely an air of sentimentality there. We're just going to disappear for a moment because the cat has just arrived and she's going to want letting in. I became quite sentimental towards my characters, I'm not going to lie, but this is a book in which it is supposed to feel cosy. It is supposed to feel in a similar fashion to the Doris books with added crime. I'm hoping the humour has come off okay and come across okay. We never know. Sometimes I do worry whether scenes are too dialogue heavy, but that doesn't matter currently because I finished it. I'm currently waiting for my friend Lindsay to guess the genre of the book and should she get it right, then I'm going to be uploading the book to a shared file we have for her to read and I might even share it with my mother soon enough. Then we'll go from there. I'm still not sure whether I am planning to ever release this book. I don't know what my thoughts on it are yet. I don't know what I'm going to write next. I have absolutely no idea because I did not plan to write this book this year. This happened because I wasn't working on the children's book and I was feeling incredibly restless through not writing, and I just thought, well, write it. You know the story, you know the characters. Don't even care about the plot right now. Just get some words down on paper, and that's what I did. And this book, it's at 62,000 words, which is right in the middle of the size of Doris 1 and Doris 2. It would be great to bring this book out and I'd really like to. I don't think it's anywhere near the point that it could come out and I also have this overwhelming feeling that maybe I ought to bring out the third Doris book which does mean actually writing the thing. I am going to leave you there. I will probably speak again soon, hopefully with some more updates but the only updates now we really have are redrafting. In my efforts to cobble this video together, I realised that there is a lack of continuity between August 2018 and June 2019, and I believe we are indeed missing a clip. However, know that I put the secret book away in August 2018 and sent it off to Joy Winkler, Margaret Holbrook and Lindsay Watson as beta readers to go through it and, and give me feedback, critique and comments. And once I'd got those, I didn't actually do much editing on the book at the time. From March 2019, I was writing Doris Ahoy. Therefore, not much work got done on an heir to murder until that book was complete in June 2019, which is where my next clip commences. I've now hit a new stumbling block in the form of the cover for An Heir to Murder. I know I need this to be different from the Doris books. Stylistically, however, my brain goes to the same place every time. Now, I found a font that I quite like. As this is a cosy crime, really, I keep calling it a cosy crime, but I can't help 
but feel as though it's somewhat more like the cosy novel with criminal aspects. As it is a cosy crime novel, I want it to be somewhat brighter than the grittier crime novels you see out there. I feel as though quite easily I could go and find a dark pictures and just shove a person on the cover and hope for the best. But in terms of these books, I need something representative of the story. I need a cover that I like. And I had this brilliant idea for it to be a bright background with an image of the murder weapon or some sort of image related to the book there. In working on the cover for Doris Ahoy, I realised how much I could use a blank background and change it well, manipulate it using Microsoft Word, which seems somewhat simple, and it's probably the only way I can go about it myself because I don't have the design background. I don't know anything about, like, Photoshop. I, I'm barely good at using GIMP. I took a photograph of my brother's floorboards because there's dark wood in there, and when I showed the image that I'd created there, Joy said it reminded her of a shed, which is at for this book. Once you read it, you'll understand why. Other people are preferring a brighter coloured background than the one I showed. And I also included a picture of my dog because I couldn't find an image of what I wanted. And nobody likes this image. I mean, well, they like it separately. It's a nice picture of my dog, but I just don't think it's suitable for the cover of a book. Therefore, I have a struggle now because I have to come up with something for the cover that is going to make people know that this book is a cosy crime novel. I have also looked at the early Agatha Christie covers, and they inspired me somewhat with the way I was going with this darker colour, because, you know, her books aren't really that dark, but the covers could be in the past, and yet now when I, I look at these vintage covers and I think there's not really much going on here, and they're very typical of the time. I look at the covers that I like of Agatha Christie and the Agatha Raisin books, all, and there's a selection of cosy crime books where I'm really impressed by the thought that's gone into the covers. I don't have the money currently to be able to hire a cover designer. I know it's probably they're relatively cheap and this should be an expense I think about, but also I do like to keep my costs as low as they can possibly be. Whilst the Doris covers aren't the best in the world, I think that I did a good enough job on them that the book is presentable. With Doris, I didn't know the cover idea I wanted for Doris. That came because of Lindsay. She first showed me, I had this idea of a slug coming out of a cup and she sent me this image that she'd photoshopped for me and then we both realised it was a bit like a black blob. My search began again. I am searching more and more for something for the murder mystery book, you, you know, to see what will fit, what works to show off the somewhat cosier, quirkier nature of this story. At one point I did consider just getting a big photograph of a stately home. I have now decided to release this book in November. So I have June, July, August, September, October. I have five to six months in which to get this book ready and release it. That is ample time for me to edit it to a state that I am happy with. I've also set myself the deadline of having everything ready by the 31st of August. The cover is where we are at the moment. Um, I haven't currently edited it because I'm working on Doris Ahoy, which seems strange to be working on all these different books at the same time. I'm, two, like, I'm currently working on three books, and by December, two of them are going to be out in the world. I know that I can do it. I know that I can pull all this together. It's just hoping that it'll pay off. It's been a long time since I last spoke to you. I can't even remember whether I told you that I'd changed the title, but either way, the book is now called An Heir to Murder. In June, I came up with a cover design. I don't know whether I'm going to use that or not. I knew that I wanted to have this book out in November. I no longer know whether that's possible because unfortunately, Lindsay can no longer edit the book. Therefore, I chose to hire an editor and I wanted someone that I know and I feel as though I can trust because I want to keep this very secret and I don't want anyone to go out there and possibly leak any details of the book. Therefore asked Dane of Dane Reads whether he 
would edit the book for me. I've read his work, I've seen that he works with other people, and he agreed. I got the final edits through yesterday, which was completely unexpected because it's only been a month and I expected him to not even have looked at it until the new year, so I'm incredibly grateful for that. Thank you, Dane. And get well soon, Lindsay. I still want to release this book. I want to release this book secretly because not for any marketing thing, I'm currently, I've released Doris Ahoy now, I should say that. I currently have 80 copies sat in my bedroom doing nothing and I have no events for it. I feel like releasing this book secretly is not a good thing because it's not going to lend itself to people actually buying the book because nobody's going to know it exists but at the same time that's exactly what I want. I just want to turn up one day and say, oh look everybody, here's a new book for you. I just like keeping the secret and keeping it close to my chest. And after what went on with Nielsen's earlier this year and I realised I couldn't even register the book without someone finding out about it, I couldn't keep it secret, I couldn't change the title, I couldn't do any of that, I decided that beggar Nielsen's. Waterstones don't really sell any books for me anyway, I don't get anyone from Gardner's sending requests, so I feel as though I could keep it quite limited, maybe only print 50 copies. I want to talk about the editing again actually, so let's do that. Let's go and talk about Dane editing the book. So firstly, this was the first time I've hired an editor. I had Lindsay for Our Doris, Lindsay and Joy Winkler for Indisputably Doris, and Doris Ahoy was completely my own work. Any errors on my own, and I'm extremely apologetic if you find anything. I did reread that book every single day. I made changes up until the day I printed copies. I'm happy with it as it is, but if there are any errors, feel free to let me know. Hiring somebody, despite the fact I knew them and I wanted to keep it a secret, and I also wanted someone who knew Doris's world because this book is set in the same world as Doris. The only thing that I ran into, and I've had to speak to, I, I spoke to Lindsay about it, this wasn't me being shady towards Dane, this was just me asking a specific question, and I get this anxiety about contacting someone who's worked so hard on something for me, and contacted them at contacting them and asking them a question that might make me look a bit thick. So I contacted Lindsay because I'm pretty sure that she already knows by now that I'm not the smartest person. Anyway, my issue related to certain sentences. Now I know that Dane mentioned on the radio, because I listened to his radio show, well it wasn't his radio show, it's um, Planet Claire and he was on there on the 19th of September and he mentioned that he was having to go through and he was seeing how my northern vernacular was coming through into the prose. However, I there was a sentence I came across and I can't even remember, it was something to do with so and that. And so I sent a message to Lindsay and just saying which way is correct and she informed me that Dane was actually correct and my way is the northern way of saying it. And I realised that yes I do put the northern vernacular in but that's just because that's apparently the way I write sentences now and that maybe my sentences aren't universally grammatically correct, but they are correct in the north. However, because I do want this to be a bit more universal than our Doris, I did end up taking out a few of the northern things. I also took out some similes that just didn't work. There was one where I just wanted to say someone looked aghast, but I said that they looked as though they'd been flashed down a ginnel. Dane wasn't the only person who flagged that up. There were even a few people who had no idea what I was getting at, and so I just removed it. And then there's another bit where I say about shoes being so polished you'd be surprised to find a crease down the centre. Margaret, Margaret Holbrook, she was one of my beta readers. She didn't get that, Dane didn't get that, and so it was removed because it was Charlie being his most filthy, dirty-minded self, which you don't usually get to see in my books. But I thought it'd be a nice joke and some of the more dirty-minded out there would understand it, but I thought if it's stopping people reading, I best remove it. So obviously I still have the edition with it in. It's now removed and there were just a few other things where I had slipped into my northern dialect because that's exactly what I do. I I talk about how just writing Doris had freed me up in terms of my writing, so I just write it as I think now. But apparently that could be the wrong way. I don't want to go through this whole northern erasure thing. You're still going to be able to see the northern dialect in the first person books, such as Our Doris, A Prior Commitment that's going to be out at some point, the novella. That is also written with a very strong northern lady at its centre in first person. Those books, I think it's fine to include the northern vernacular because as Dane says, as people keep telling me, it's fine to have dialect 
if it's supposed to be the way a person's speaking. However, in this third person book that I've written, it has to be removed. And so that is what I've done. I also had a huge problem yesterday because Dane sent me the edits back and I didn't realise there was a button where you can say accept all changes. And so I'd read all the changes and then I was manually going through my own document and making the changes and it took me six hours to do 20 pages and I went to Lindsay and I said there's got to be some easier way of doing this and she said I just had to press accept all changes. And so I did. And honestly, I felt the most nauseous I've ever felt in my life because I'd lost six hours whilst I went through every single individual page and made every small change. I'm incredibly grateful for all of the time that Dana's actually spent going through and making these changes for me and moving sentences around because honestly, there's something wrong with me that I read my own sentences and they make perfect sense to me. Even when I read them, they make sense to me, but they make no sense to anybody else. And I don't know what is actually wrong with me that I'm not able to gauge whether they're incorrect or not. I'm sure I could do it with somebody else's prose, but that might even be a lie. That might even be a lie. I feel as though I could have this book finished by November. I feel as though Dane went through it really quickly being the good person that he is just so that I would be able to do that and it's 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 strange finding this support that I didn't know was there or that I knew was there but I didn't want to use. I feel like I am the worst kind of person when it comes to friends because I will use them for my own gain, um, such as reading my books. And I worry that I've become the sort of person who just says, will you read this for me? And then despite the fact that I'm grateful of the time that they're giving me, I don't want to be known as the person who just keeps foisting his work upon people. And so it's making it incredibly difficult for me to actually go out of my way to ask people whether they'll read my work, whether they'll flag up issues with it. Joy and Margaret both gave me issues last year. I fixed all of Margaret's. There was one major one that I didn't fix of Joy's and it's just one of those things where I don't know that I'm going to fix that and then I feel really bad that I'm not going to change these things because nobody else has noticed the issue and I don't know whether it's I didn't notice the issue and then out of the other five people only been one person with the problem the same for something another person said and it's difficult it is difficult because I don't want to offend anybody either I don't want to not include something or not change something and have them say well you know we give you feedback and then you do this and you don't even change it I make the effort I've been working on this book for a year underneath well, over a year now by the time it comes out it will have been nearly two years of work I had the idea for the story when I was 12 and so that's 15 years ago I constantly tried it with different detectives I have this idea of doing it like a competition or just a guessing game and maybe somebody could win a free copy from it where they guess all the people who could have been detectives in previous drafts because I included every single person that I've had as a detective previously in this book. Then Alice came into my head, Alice Valentine, the protagonist, arrived in my head. I always knew she was going to have a book of her own. Being here at this point where her book could be out. I feel this great sense of accomplishment but I also have this great sense of worry that people aren't going to like it and it might not be as good as I think. I don't know, Cozy Crime is something that I've always wanted to write. I never saw it the same. I, I think I saw it, someone said about Midsummer Murders being more of a character piece and it wasn't all about one character and it was about the entire village. And I always had the idea of doing that. I read it in the Agatha Raisin books and despite the fact I don't like what I've read recently, I feel as though, you know, you get similar characters and the same characters in each one. And I've always wanted to have this big community aspect to my books and I've been working on this for years and you might not you might see hints towards stuff that i have worked on and i feel like it's a shared universe type thing i'm like creating my own marvel cinematic universe with partridge and muse characters you've seen in other books will arrive in this book and i just feel like they're the nice things for people who've been here all along but they're also going to have their own stories that you might not have seen or you might never see you know if the book doesn't work out i won't release it um you'll see names coming up that come up in other books and it's such a big thing and as i write each book that i have planned it feels as though I am getting further along in the story but also releasing more of it into the world and also it releases the pressure that I feel from all of these characters wanting all of their own stories. I feel as though I might be a bit too protective and that I think that that's a problem. I will probably get back in touch with you in another month maybe, possibly, 
Probably not, but I hope that the next time we speak, it might be with a finished book. Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today, the 14th of November 2019, is the day that I am supposed to be releasing my secret book. It's now Wednesday the 8th of January and I have received my proof copy of An Heir to Murder. It looks like this. It has that horrible not for resale banner that Amazon puts around its books. I've already had someone at work complain about the waxy feel this cover has and unfortunately I don't think there's anything I can do about that. I always prefer a matte cover to a shiny cover and this is what was on offer. I know that there is an issue with the cover already. I really want murder to be central which means moving the text and I wanted a solid green spine as some of the front cover has gone around onto that side despite my best efforts for that not to happen. So it looks as though I will be having a second proof of the book done. I'm also not sure about the size of the blurb on the back. Both me and my dad agree that the larger font on the back might be good for people who don't have the best vision in the world. Basically, I'm going through it and reading it. I'm currently at page 132, so at the halfway mark. So far, most of the issues I've noticed have been with formatting. There have been places where I have changed something in editing and now I want to change it back because I feel like it sounded better the first time round. This is purely in dialogue. As Dane told me throughout his read of this book, I still slip into Harold's vernacular when writing fiction, and so that happened with this book. And so there were places where I removed it, but this is a piece of dialogue where I think it would be fitting to leave it as it was before. Some places I think that I removed northern vernacular to make it sound more palatable to other people, and that isn't working for me in a very specific part. Another formatting issue I have is that sometimes the indentation in these on the pages is too far in so I need to go back and change that and this is all stuff that I thought I'd done so I don't know where it's gone wrong maybe it was just missed. It's an odd sensation to be reading the book in this form ha with it having been so long since I finished writing the book and it being so long since I received Dane's edits for the book and announced it. Unlike Doris Ahoy where I was reading it because I had that book coming out a lot sooner than with An Heir to Murder, because there's been more of a time span between when I last read it and now, I'm reading things and I'm questioning, did I write that? I think it sounds writerly, but also was it something that was edited in? I have this really horrible sensation the entire time whilst reading it where I think, is it not complex enough? Should there be more red herrings, more twists in here? I was watching an episode of Midsummer Murders last night and it was throwing all these bits in of people who could be killers and I was thinking, should I have done that? Because I question, is it is this mystery too easy to solve? It's been 18 months before I wrote it and then four months of writing. It's been a long process to put this one book together. Maybe I shouldn't question myself as much, which is the whole thing with all of these flaming clips, isn't it? Throughout this entire video, every clip over the last two years has been me questioning just how I feel going forward with this book. And as we get closer to the two year mark, I feel like I am going to have to let this book go in February and yet despite the fact that I read it and I can't find issues with it because as I mentioned that there's a big plan for these books and I'm hoping I can pull it off so obviously there are things in this book that don't get resolved but that's the whole point with it being a series so you have the core story and then you have a series arc and it's all planned in my head. I haven't planned individual books I've just I've planned the arc but not the books. I just question my own abilities and I think that maybe I should stop that. This is a proof copy. The next time you'll probably see me will be with a finished copy. I had this weird, weird dream last night where I did some sort of book fair. I was selling an heir to murder but I only had this proof copy and there was this 
person who I knew, I can't even remember who they were now. So I said, oh, I'll just get the book to you when I see you. But then there was this American person, and I don't know who this American was. I never met them before. The only American people I seem to know are from the internet, and we've never conversed in, you know, face to face. And this person bought my book. I gave them their change, and then I went, oh, sorry, I've just realised I don't actually have any copies. Could you give me your address so I can post it to you? And they gave me an address in San Francisco. I don't think I know anybody there. And as we get closer to February and the release date, I become more nervous because I have absolutely no idea whether anybody is going to want this book in their lives. Today is Tuesday the 4th of February. I have just recorded an intro and outro to this video. But what I didn't get to say is that I am mildly terrified. I ordered my finished copies on Sunday. This came after trying to get the cover changed I don't know how many times. The second proof came through and it had this green stripe down the side. And I showed this to everyone and then I decided that I didn't actually mind that being there. So I went to print all my copies of this edition and it decided, no, I'm sorry, we don't like how close the text is on the back. There was something wrong with the text on the cover. I ended up having to go back in and each time I tried to upload it I was having to wait so I'd send it in to see whether they'd accept it. They weren't accepting it and then I was trying to see their guidelines. Eventually after nearly a week of trying to get the cover correct I still managed to keep a tiny bit of the green on the, on the side of the cover like I wanted because I ended up liking it. They accepted it and so I have ended up making it available on Amazon, which I didn't want to do. The Kindle edition is now available to pre-order. In ordering my 100 copies, it's now saying that they will arrive between next Monday and next Thursday. My book releases on Wednesday, and I have an event on Tuesday for this book. So if I don't at least get a couple of them on Monday, I am absolutely royally up shit's creek. This ain't that funny comedy that I've heard about, no. This is actually me completely terrified that I have no idea what's going to happen next week. Yes, people can say, you shouldn't have left it so late, Charlie. I wasn't trying to leave it so late. I was trying to have this book done a while back. I know that I could have gone through all of this when I announced the book back in November. I just needed to print copies back then, get it all formatted and everything, but I didn't do it. And that's all on me. And I get that. I get that I shouldn't have decided to focus on Vlogmas. I should have done more on my books. I get it. I understand. I regret it now. Is that enough for you? Also, I've been trying to arrange events with libraries. That hasn't gone very well. I currently have two events. One of them is next Tuesday. One of them is at the end of March. I'm really going to have to work at finding other places that will allow me to go. If it isn't libraries, I don't know what it's going to be. I honestly have absolutely no idea what I'm going to do if these copies don't arrive. I was watching a clip last night from January and I said I'd had a dream where I was doing an event and I only had this copy and so I was taking money off people, taking their addresses and going around and posting them out. It's the closer we get, it, the more it feels like that is going to be exactly what happens. <sighs> oh, God. This was going to be the clip where I had a finished copy and I flaunted it to you and then I saved the video, rendered it and posted it to YouTube for everyone to peruse and Lord, that's not happened. It was fine when this happened with Doris Ahoy because I wasn't doing any events. Even if the book had been late, I could still say it's avail available to buy on Amazon, you can download a Kindle edition. You couldn't download a Kindle edition at the time, but you can now. But I actually have events for this one. I have one week left and I have absolutely no books in my house to sell. I had hoped to actually have some of them by next Monday because I thought that I could go across the road to the library and give them one when I was in work and just start distributing them to try and just get them into libraries to get people borrowing them. Uh, I just need to stop worrying and I hope that it'll all work out, don't I? Really, basically. Considering I didn't know that I would be releasing the book so soon, I thought it'd be lingering in a drawer 
until I finish the final Doris book. The fact that I am doing also fills me with anxieties and worries and frustrations. One week. One bloody week. Yesterday morning I checked Amazon to locate my copies of An Heir to Murder because three people have already had their copies and are reading them and are talking about it and I'm worried people are going to start thinking that I've sent out review copies that I don't have yet. If you recall, I have ordered 100 copies and there were three boxes of 33 books being sent my way for arrival on Monday. That's great. That's fine. That's fantastic. But that only adds up to 99. And then at the end of the day, I got this message through to say that three boxes of 33 books had been dispatched. Plus one. One book. One book will be arriving on its own. And I just cannot believe the amount of packaging that's going to take up. I, I want to sell these 100 books incredibly quickly. This isn't me being horrible <laughs> and me thinking that I'm somewhat better than I am. I need to sell these 100 books because I do not have the space in my room. There will be a link in the description to purchase these books <laughs> from me because... I still have copies of Doris Ahoy, I have copies of Indisputably Doris, I have copies of Our Doris, and they're under my bed, they're under my washing basket, they're everywhere. My room is breeding books, and I need some space back. I don't have room, I don't have a warehouse, I just need some people to go out there and buy my books and be kind to me. And people will say, well, Charlie, why did you buy 100 books? It's like, because I am ever hopeful. And if you wanted to know something, if I wanted to do writing as a full-time occupation as an indie author, I would have to sell 100 copies of a book per month just to be able to get by. And that's only 1,200 copies a year. Even at that, I'd still have to live with my parents. Just wanted to put that into perspective for you. And that's not even counting my own costs there. If we were going to talk about my own costs, you could double that. Just saying. Be kind to your local indie author who just wants to pay his rent this month. <sighs> these books need to arrive. We're on day six of waiting for these books to arrive and they still haven't arrived. And I only have three more full days for them to arrive before I go to an event in Wilmslow and there's every chance my books won't be there. It's fine if they're not. I will turn it around, I will call it an event for Doris Ahoy and apologise to people, but that's not going to make me look good, is it? I am worried because, as we all know, there is this storm, is it Ciara? Ciara? I don't know. It's a storm, and apparently it's coming, and my books are currently on a plane. But will this storm mean that my books don't arrive? I don't know. I am concerned about it. It's been a week since I ordered my books and they still haven't arrived. There are people currently reading them on Goodreads who've purchased the book through Amazon to support me and I haven't yet got a single copy for myself. There's a storm outside that they said was coming but me being me, I hoped that it wouldn't so as I could get my books here sooner. There are just two full days left before an heir to murder is unleashed upon the world and I don't have a single copy. <sighs> I literally only just stopped recording but I have discovered that apparently all 100 books are going to arrive today. It's Sunday. Am I about to get 100 copies of an heir to murder on my day off so that I didn't have to worry about them leaving them in the bin like last time. Did I ever tell this story before? It, it was indisputably Doris and I'd ordered all the books and back then because of when I'd finished it and how long I got to wait I'd finished it with enough time that I didn't have to do an expedited delivery and I didn't know that they were coming and then I walked into the house one day and they were sat there on the table the box was looking this tiniest bit tatty and my brother informed me that had he not gone out to the recycling 
that morning to put something in, then all of my books would have been recycled that day because it was bin day. And the, I hadn't had any message at all to say that the books had been left in the bin. They were just in the bin. Either way, maybe, hopefully, possibly, I am going to have some copies of An Heir to Murder to be going on with. And isn't that just grand? It was getting a bit close to the wire there, but the finished copies have arrived. Which means that I am all set for this week. It's a strange culmination of two years' work for me to finally be sat here with three boxes of my book. A book that I started planning many years ago and didn't even start writing for nearly 18 months after I came up with the initial plan for this book. It's been a long time in the making. It still feels somewhat surreal. I did it. I finally managed to write a crime novel. It went to places I didn't expect it to. Something I didn't document in these videos was the death of my grandmother and how that contributed to the discussion of grief within this book. Yet the book is still cosy, it's still funny, and I hope that should you read it, you actually end up liking it and the characters, because I like them and I'm going to keep writing them. So I suppose this is me after two years of work signing off. And that's that. This book has been two years in the making. It is the longest I have ever spent on one individual project. As I kept saying throughout the entirety of this video, I first had the idea for this book when I was 12, although not with the current protagonist. It took me a while to find my way into this world. It took writing our Doris to realise that what I was calling comedy and what I was thinking of as too basic to be actual writing is actually just my writerly voice. And I found my voice through Doris. I found my voice through working with other editors. I have to realise that my brain is not going to work the same way as every other writer in the world and sometimes it's okay not to be searching to write high literary books. It is enough just to write the books that make you smile and you enjoy working with. I spent a lot of these last two years incredibly worried that this book was a waste of my time and that the people I was asking to help me were ultimately helping me with a failing project. But now I have to say I am incredibly proud of what I have created and I have this itch to return to the world, this tingling sensation to reacquaint myself with the characters and continue their stories. I think that my writing and my characterization and my storytelling has come a long way since then. I guess now is the time to thank people who have helped me throughout the writing of this book and the creation of it. So firstly I'm going to start with Lindsay Watson. Lindsay has been my friend for over a decade now. She has seen all the horrible juvenile fiction that I wrote back in the day and has constantly coached me and molly coddled me and helped me become the writer that I currently am. So some of the blame is on her. I feel as though I often put too much upon her and give her too much to deal with but being the incredibly supportive friend that she is she has helped me out no end and therefore she deserves some gratitude. Next I'm going to mention my mother. Catherine Heathcote. When I first started releasing books, my mother did ferry me to events. She was my driver, she was the one person I had for support in the audience. Oftentimes people will remember her as Charles Heathcote's mum or your Charlie's mum, one of the two, and I think that that's a nice moniker to have. Whilst we may have had a huge argument when she skipped to the end to find out just who the murderer was, that should be water under the bridge by now. I don't think many people would drive their son halfway across the country just to go to an hour-long event. But my mother did, and therefore 
I'm saying she's better than yours. Next, I will thank Joy Winkler, who I first met when she started the Macclesfield Creative Writing Group way back in 2011. And I sent my first email at the age of 19 asking whether there will be tea and biscuits because I'll go anywhere for tea and biscuits. Nine years down the line, she helped me get a first in one of my classes in my second year of uni because she allowed me to go and shadow her during creative writing workshops she was giving to women in Salford. She has been incredibly supportive of all my writing, read my poetry. She edited Indisputably Doris when things went awry and I really needed to knuckle down and get that book out. She has gone above and beyond the call of duty of being a friend, being a mentor, and writing her own stuff as well. She's done two verse dramas, released two poetry collections, and still continued to help me with my work. And that is just immense. And I don't know that I will ever be able to pay back everything that she has done for me. Then I also have to thank Margaret Holbrook, another indie author who beta read this book for me as well and offered her feedback. I knew that cosy crime was a genre she enjoyed, so I knew that the feedback was going to be honest, it was going to be helpful, and this is just another in a long line of books that Margaret has helped me with, as well as helping me find events, putting me in touch with librarians, giving me opportunities to read my work, open mics, and to continue to sell my books, and she's just been amazing. And then I also have to thank Dane of Dane Reads, Dane Cobain, indie author, freelance editor extraordinaire and extremely helpful when it came to helping me get this book finished. Dane edited the book for me and answered really stupid questions that I had. He's the reason that the book got announced in November, he's the reason that we chose to wait until February to release the book. He has looked at covers, he's given me incredibly insightful feedback, all whilst writing his own books and doing his own work, and he also got this book edited way before the deadline, just so as I could try and release this book for the original date in November. And for that, I am thankful. I don't know how else I can share my thanks, share my gratitude with you for what you have done, other than put you in the acknowledgements page of An Heir to Murder. I should also thank the booktubers that have read my previous books and reviewed them and shared them with folks, supported them, mentioned them on Instagram. Still don't understand Instagram but I'll thank you anyway. And also pre-ordered copies of An Heir to Murder and sent me requests for copies even though the book's not out. Sent me your support. This is one of the things I'm incredibly grateful for because throughout the entirety of this book I didn't realise that I actually had a support network there in the form of booktube and I should have recognised that earlier because you have all been brilliant, amazing, awesome, marvellous, splendiferous and alas there are not enough adjectives in the world to explain how good you all are. Which is also my way of saying thank you for watching this video. Thank you for liking and subscribing and commenting and interacting with me and being all round blooming fabulous people. It warmed a heart I thought I'd replaced with a bread oven in 2007 and I just feel as though I have run out of words to express how grateful, thankful I am and how totes amazeballs you all are. And thank you if you stuck around the entirety of this video. An Heir to Murder is now available to purchase. It's been a long time coming. I hope you enjoy getting to meet Alice Valentine and her rather rambunctious friends, acquaintances and family. I hope that you adore her story as much as I have adored telling it and I look forward to seeing more of you all in the future. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. And until next time, that is all.